Yeah, thank you very much, um, Nina, for the very kind introduction and um, good morning also from my side. It's indeed a great pleasure to be here today and also a great honor to yeah, open this great conference with the first um, technical presentation. So, yeah, I'm really excited now to share with you in the next half hour some recent and ongoing work of my group on active photonic metal surfaces empowered by two dimensional semiconductor. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, of course, everything I'm going to show um, has been a team effort, so we collaborate intensively locally um, at the Schiller University of Vienna and also around the globe with um, Australian National University on this topic. And um, yeah, so we are at Meta Conference. So probably I would it would be very hard to find anyone in this audience who has never heard what a meta surface is. Um, but still, since it's the first talk, please allow me a very short introduction generally to the field. So basically, a uh, meta surface um, is a sheet of nanoscale thickness here oriented out of the plane of the projector. And if we come in with some known input light fields, um, it transforms this into some output light field with desired properties such as spectrum, polarization, wavefront, and so on. How does it do it? So the magic lies in the structure. It's basically a two dimensional sub wavelengths arrangement of designed nanoscale building blocks. And yeah, if we change our, the design as a function of in plane position, we can impose a spatially varying phase shift onto the incident light field. And um, this leads them to control of the wavefront. For instance, in this very simple example, if I have a linear phase gradient implemented, this will lead to the deflection of the incident beam. So metasurfaces are closely related to other concepts in nanophotonics. For instance, they are the two-dimensional counterparts of optical metamaterials. Um, you can also view them as two-dimensional arrays of optical nano antennas. And also it's maybe important to say that they differ from photonic crystal slabs as no periodicity and also no in-plane confinement is required. And um, yeah, more importantly, metal surfaces are basically characterized by their flat aerial nature and also by the large number of spatial modes that they can provide due to this in-plane variability. So wavefront shaping metal surfaces have been really in the limelight of nanophotonics in the last more than a decade now, yeah. And um, their huge potential really comes from their flat nature, which makes them very light made, lightweight, integrable, and um, also because we can really um, have these highly tailorable optical functions in them, and also the possibility to have multifunctionality. So basically, a single meta surface can be able to replace the whole sequence of classical optical elements. Yeah, and of course, um, there have been many applications identified, and um, here due to time, I can really only show, show some snapshots of some of my favorite examples from the literature. So basically, wavefront shaping metasurfaces have large potential in augmented and virtual reality, also in holography and imaging, in information processing, um, and also in quantum optics. All right, so this already has quite a large application scope. Um, but metasurfaces um, have more to offer. They can also be optically resonant systems. Yeah? And um, there are several kinds of resonances that we can use, um, basically. Um, so the most simple type are mu resonances. Um, yeah, so they can be of either electric or magnetic type, and they can have different multipolar order. And this is also nice because we can basically play with superposition of these multipoles to tailor their optical functions. However, there's one problem a bit with the mu resonances, which is that their quality factors are relatively low. And if we yeah, want to go towards higher quality factors, we also have the opportunity to use, for example, kernel resonant metasurfaces, metasurfaces supporting quasi bound states in the continuums, and um, also maybe anaphore resonances. So this way we can get a high Q. Why is it important? Um, basically, um, yeah. It's, it's, it's really interesting to consider resonant optical metasurfaces because they exhibit several features that are really inherently connected to their resonant optical response. And um, yeah, this um, basically offers us then vast potential for applications and fundamental science, which is far beyond the passive wavefront shaping even. 
And um, the one thing is that, yeah, resonance systems are inherently dispersive. So in such meta surfaces, we can exploit strong spatial and spectral, and spectral dispersion, giving us the opportunity to tailor, for instance, frequency or angular sensitive optical response. Also, um, it facilitates tuning or switching if we have this strong dispersion. And the other big point is um, if we have resonances, yeah, basically each little meta atom acts like a little nano antenna. And, resonantly enhances and concentrates the near fields yeah, in the vicinity of the meta atoms. And this can be used for enhancing and tailoring of light matter interactions. Um, for instance, um, this can be but to enhance nonlinear optical effects, also emission phenomena, or generally coupling to um, material and material degrees of freedom. So we can see that um, this brings us directly um, to active metal surfaces and that really, um, yeah, these resonant metal surfaces have a particular high potential there. And with active, I mean this in a quite broad sense encompassing um, tunable, light emitting and nonlinear metal surface systems. If we go to such active architectures, this really greatly enhances the scope and application potential again of meta surfaces. So if we have here our three categories, tunable, light emitting, nonlinear, we can, for instance, immediately think of adaptive optical systems, light modulators, um, also lasers, displays and light sources, and um, ultrapass switches, as well as coherent and quantum light sources. So yeah, that's a huge field. And um, at least in my talk, I will concentrate now on the two following um, um, yeah, categories, light emitting and nonlinear. And let me briefly also introduce what um, they are all about. So um, if you think about light emitting metal surfaces, I show you my little cartoon from the beginning again. And um, the idea here would be to get rid of this known input light field and have the metal surfaces by itself emit the desired output light field. How can we do that? So basically, we can consider the meta surface now as an array of resonant dielectric nano antennas or resonant nano antennas in general, driven by localized sources. And what can it help us? So basically, there are two things that the meta surfaces can be good at. One is brightness enhancement through various mechanisms like excitation and quantum yield enhancement, but also extraction and collection efficiency enhancement, which is, of course, related to the spatial emission profile of the coupled system. And um, this is um, yeah, also something um, like a point by itself that the meta surface is very good at shaping emission patterns because we can combine the effect of the individual meta atom, which can already be a directional nano antenna, yeah, with the effect of the array or arrangement. So we get many um, yeah, degrees of freedom to tailor the directional properties. What about nonlinear meta surfaces? So it's a huge field by itself. So I concentrate here on the example of second harmonic generation. Um, again, I show you a little cartoon where here's the meta surface. And now, such a nonlinear meta surface, if we come in with a field at frequency omega, it can transform part of this into light at different frequencies. So, for the example of second harmonic generation, light at two omega. And meta surfaces are very interesting in this respect because. Um, they provide this resonant near field enhancement so that even from this nanoscale thickness sheet, we get yeah, substantial efficiencies for this nonlinear conversion. Also, um, again, we have these many spatial degrees of freedom, which can help us really tailor the light at the generated frequencies. And yeah, maybe most importantly, because the meta surface is so thin, no face matching is required. Yeah, so um, um, and whoever um, did nonlinear experiments, face matching can really be a pain in the neck. So at some stage, people are really happy to sacrifice a little bit of efficiency by the by not be by not needing to care about face matching. All right. Um, so. Generally, a key challenge for such active meta surfaces is now um, to yeah, integrate the suitable active material into the meta surface architecture. And this is where the 2D materials come into play. And also here, just a very brief general introduction. So 2D materials consist of just a single layer of atoms or molecules. <laughs> there are actually hundreds of different species. Um, and yeah. Um, graph, it all started from graphene, for which Gaiman Novoselov received the 2010 Nobel Prize. Yeah, however, despite its huge success, graphene is semi metal and this limits the applications in electronics and also electronics. And um, what we really want for our active meta surfaces are basically two dimensional semiconductors, ideally with a direct photonic band gap. 
And yeah, the most promising class here are two dimensional um, transition metal dichite portionites or TMDCs. And they have such a structure that they consist of one layer of transition metal atoms, which assemble like usually tungsten or um, um, yeah, um, so tungsten or um, the other one, sorry, I, I'm on my show, I miss it at the moment. And this is sandwiched between two layers of, um, of carcodons, basically um, uh, sulfur or selenium. All right. Um, ah, yeah, and what I should mention is what's quite important is um, that the crystal structure of these materials is um, lacks inversion symmetry. And I will come back to this point several times. I am molybdenum, sorry. <laughs> Alzheimer. <laughs> okay, so um, so here are now if we yeah so so what active functionalities can these two D TMDCs provide us with? And um, so the important thing is if we thin them down to the monolayer phase, um, they basically become direct bands of semiconductors, so they provide us with a strong photoluminescence. Yeah, that's already nice. Then because of the lack of inversion symmetry of their crystal structure, um, they have a yeah, non-vanishing um, second order nonlinear susceptibility. And yeah, because they are so flat, the excitons are confined in 2D and also screening is absent so that um, the exciton binding in these materials is very strong and pres is preserved at room temperature even so that um, yeah, these effects and also in particular this um, this non-linearities here, they are really enhanced um, by the excitonic resonances. And finally, um, because these effects are excitonically dominated, um, we can also easily tune this behavior, both the non-linearity and also the light emission um, by electrically gating these materials. So we see we have all these categories we're interested in, light emission, non-linear and tunability, um, we get from our 2D TMDCs. Okay, so what do we have to do? We basically have to bring these two systems together, the metal surface, the 2D material, and um, because they are both sort of two-dimensional systems, if you want, um, uh, it's really ideal for integration. It's basically like putting a slice of cheese on a bread. Okay, in this case, we have a bilayer here. Um, and um, yeah, then what do we get from this? Um, basically, the two systems help each other if you want. The 2D TMDC acts as a light emitting, nonlinear, and tunable component. And on the other hand, mm -hmm. the meta surface enhances the interaction with this ultra thin, ma thin material um, by sub wavelength light concentration. Okay, let me give you a more realistic picture. So this is a typical architecture we look at in our experiments, like some kind of metal surface, and then we transfer um, some monolayers on top. Um, in many cases, these are grown by CVD, so they have this triangular shape if they are single crystals, but um, exfoliation um, is also possible and we use it. Okay, first I will show you something in the realm of light emitting metasurfaces. And um, the very first thing we did, um, quite simple, we just looked at the silicon um, nano cylinder metasurface and transferred some MOS2 on top. Yeah? So we varied the silicon nano cylinder diameter to sweep the mirror resonance over the emission bandwidth of the MOS2. And if you look at the emission properties of this coupled system, okay, hooray, we could see some enhancement, but um, we have to be careful. It's actually to a very small degree photonic enhancement. It's mainly because we're comparing the freestanding nature of the MOS2 on the meta surface with the um, TMDC on the substrate where some substrate induced quenching occurs. Yeah, so, but what can the meta surface do? Um, and here we come to the shaping of the light emission. And um, what I show here are back focal plane images of emission. So basically, each point here corresponds to a directionality of emission, the center being the out of plane emission of the substrate, uh, so of the meta surface plane. Yeah. So if we um, now change the diameter and sweep the, um, yeah, the mirror resonances in overlap with the emission of the TMDC, then what we see is that from this more sideways directed emission, we move to a more out of plane emission. Yeah. Okay, so this can be tailored and that's sort of nice. But okay, um, in principle, you can do this with any other emitter. There's nothing special here about the TMDC. Um, so maybe let's move to something where the TMDC really provides us with something unique. And that's if you look at its valley physics and selection rules. So due to this inversion symmetry break of the lattice of the monolayer, um, the TMDC has two inequivalent values, um, K and K prime. 
And um, this means that, um, yeah, we have fairly dependent optical selection rules and interband transitions become spin dependent. So for instance, if I come with left-handed circularly polarized light, I will have left-handed circularly polarized um, um, photoluminescence. And right, same for right-handed. And this is very interesting for electronics, where people want to use the value polarization state for information storage and processing. And the idea is now to use metasurfaces to write, manipulate, and read out value information at the nanoscale. So this field of value coupling experiments has been um, has become quite um, yeah rich in nanophotonics, and there have been several experiments shown, for instance, um, directional effects of the decay of Valley polarized excitons coupling to nano wires to groove to, to metallic groove arrays and also some nano antennas. And this um, very recent work here also shows um, the coupling of valley polarized um, excitons to yeah, a silicon metasurface. So we also um, did something in this yeah, realm. And um, basically, what we wanted to look at is valley routing um, using a gold nano bar antenna. So value routing means that um, if we have an excitonic population sitting in the K-valley, for instance, and this will decay, the light will go to one direction. And if we have it sitting in the K-prime valley, the light should go to another direction. So we were inspired by this work by Chen et al. Um, from ANU, um, where this multipolar gold bar nano antenna was designed um, using a spinning electric dipole as the yeah as the light source here in the center, and um, depending on the sense of rotation, the light was going in different directions. So we implemented this together with the Australian with Dragonist Group in Australia um, experimentally, and um, yeah, basically looked at the valley contrast. Um, so the nice thing is that we now have a very small system, yeah, with a small footprint, but which we can still also produce with top-down um, techniques, yeah. And um, also in our experiments, we took a lot of care for really um, controlling both the excitation and detection polarization, yeah, because only this allows us to really separate simple spin momentum locking effects in the system, also from true valley coupling effects. And um, what we found in these contrast images, um, yeah, for different um, for different excitation and um, detection polarizations, is that we see is a valley routing effect. However, the effect is much smaller than expected from theory. Yeah, and um, it's not only us. If you look at um, yeah most of the resonant nanophotonic works coupling to TMDCs, there is really still a lack of quantitative agreement of numerical simulation and yeah, and, and what you actually see in the experiment. Um, but it's an, it's an important thing. If we want to optimize and, and create these structures, we really need a way to model them reliably and also predict everything, like also the, the polarization properties and so on. So our question was now, how can we more reliably um, model valley polarization in a classical full wave simulation? And for this, we went back to a much more simple system, just a gold nanoparticle um, on an MOS2 monolayer, separated by a little space dielectric spacer layer. Um, and we were then um, Tobias and Slater are doing these quite challenging experiments here at 4 Kelvin. Yeah. And um, we are we're pump, like we're pumping this with circularly polarized light and looking at the photoluminescence emission. And um, yeah, basically, um, this is what we find. Um, here we have a monolayer flake for sigma plus and sigma minus excitation. And at the points of the nanoparticles, which are in the circuits here, we find a strong and robust depolarization effect, which really survives for many different samples, many different excitation detection um, yeah, um, experiments and so on. So where does this come from and how can we model this? Um, so the depolarization could of course happen at many points, yeah, at the excitation level already, during the exciton life cycle, through some coupling and so on, at the emission level itself, or also due to some unpolarized background signals. However, so we did a whole range of experiments and numerics, um, basically seeing that the effect at the emission level should be dominating this. And um, yeah, so then we look basically at the different um, modeling possibilities here and the prevalent model in the literature is basically to use a single rotating um, electric dipole. So we situated this directly under the nanoparticle. And if we calculate for this, this is the back focal plane um, with polarization states. Yeah, for the single spinning, for the single rotating dipole, we cannot reproduce this depolarization. The polarization would just stay. So at some stage, we have the idea to use a different kind of um, 
dipole source, which is also chiral, namely the dual symmetric dipole um, pioneered by um, Ivan fernandez Corbaton from KIT. We also simulated that and firstly we're quite excited because it looks like a depolarization, but um, the thing is that this does not predict the um, polarization properties of the monolayer away from the nanoparticles, so we also had to discard this. And um, what we now found is that um, the whole effect can really be, um, yeah, the depolarization effect can be explained by spatial averaging. So whereas we have this um, high degree of circular polarization, um, if, this, if the dipole is located at the center of the nanoparticle, if we move the two away from each other, this very rapidly decays. And what's more, um, at the points where it's minimal, the intensity is highest. So if you integrate over that, you really get about an order of magnitude of depolarization, which is quite well matching our experiments. So yeah, we think that um, this understanding now will really help us to improve our models and will be a key for development of effective metasurface designs exploiting belly coupling effects. So um, let me switch gears now a bit and come from this very fundamental to a little bit something with a bit more applied perspective and also changing to the nonlinear realm of active metasurfaces. So again, First, um, what we tried to do was to look again at enhancement and spatial control of second harmonic generation. So I will basically concentrate on second harmonic generation here. So in this um, in this work that I'm showing here, we basically coupled an MOS2 monolayer to a highly resonant silicon metasurface, and we could show quite a dramatic enhancement of second harmonic generation in the coupled system. And um, in this Next work here at the bottom, basically, we can also make something like a metasurface by directly nanostructuring such a nanoscale MOS2 layer and thereby um, yeah, generating a very, very thin metasurface, which is actually able to also generate um, complex spatial light fields, like in our case, we made um, such vortex beams in the second harmonic. Okay, this works again, but um, similar as in other cases, um, let, let's see if the, met, if, if the 2D TMDC can also provide us with some unique physics that we don't have um, in other systems. And here um, I summarize some of the advanced second harmonic properties of the 2D TMDCs. And um, yeah, so the what, what we see is that due to this inversion, lack of inversion symmetry of the crystal structure, this also determines the nonlinear tensor of the 2D material. And um, it was shown already in 2015 that we can get chiral second harmonic um, from the 2D TMDC if we pump it with circularly polarized light. And basically um, in the second harmonic, the sense like the, the chirality um, will switch its sign. And um, due to the same nonlinear tensor properties, there's also a very nice effect shown by Giancarlo Soavi's group, also in Jena, um, who managed to show ultra-fast all optical modulation of second harmonic generation in 2D TMDCs. So basically what you see here is that if you shine on the TMDC um, two pulses, um, which are of opposite linear polarization and they arrive subsequently on the material, you get here a polarization, in this case, along the armchair direction of the 2D TMDC. However, if these two pulses arrive simultaneously, um, the second harmonic polarization will be rotated by 90 degrees. Yeah? So this is basically uh, pulse duration limited switching of this polarization of the second harmonic. And we wanted to make use of this effect and um, um, use this in a joint work um, with Giancarlo's group, um, yeah, basically to show ultra-fast second harmonic wavefront control. So this is a system we are looking at. Basically, um, yeah, um, we have a hybrid meta-optical system consisting of a WSE2 monolayer um, with a silicon metasurface. And um, to avoid these um, problems of not so well understood near field coupling of these chiral effects, um, we did this in the far field regime, far field coupling regime. So basically, we have the 2D material, um, this which generates the, the second harmonic with the switching effect, and we have a cross wave plate, and then we have a polarization sensitive metasurface. And in this example here, um, depending if the pulses arrive subsequently or together, we can then, for instance, um, switch here from a Gaussian to a vortex field. Here's some details of the experiment. Just the, this is the flake we used, the WSE2 monolayer. Um, we reproduced um, this ultra fast um, switching of the polarization um, of the second harmonic um, at 1550 nanometer for this material. And um, we also designed such a meta, such meta surfaces. Um, 
for ultrafast diffraction switching, Gaussian toward exchange switching, and optotopological charge switching here. And I give you here the in the in the bottom, in the top row, um, these are the phase masks for left-handed and right-handed circular polarizations that we're implementing. And then you always see um, for each metal surface here a light microscope image and a um, scanning electron micrograph of the system. Okay, so what do we expect? Um, this is just theory. So um, we are shining the left-handed or right-handed circular polarized light on the metal surface. And um, for diffraction switching, yeah, we just um, expect that the main of the light um, would go into the minus first diffraction order and then goes to the first diffraction order if we change the handedness of the of the incident light. Um, in the second one, um, we see a Gaussian or a water stream depending on the polarization. And in the yeah, in the last one, we do topological charge switching of the vortex. And this is a bit challenging because they would have the same far field pattern if we have a um, topical topological charge of minus or plus one. So um, additionally, we apply an astigmatic transformation, which transforms this into such a stripe pattern, where depending on the topological charge, um, the inclination of these stripes is yeah, changing. All right, now comes the interesting part. This is the experiment. And note, this is now not just changing the incident circular polarization, but instead, this is now yeah, an ultra-fast experiment where we are coming in with um, pulses of about 210 to second length, and they are either... Um, okay, they are either arriving um, one after the other or simultaneously, so delay time of, of um, zero. And if we then look um, at the output of the system, yeah, we basically can reproduce all of these effects quite nicely. Yeah, so um, this seems to work well. So to convince you um, that this is indeed now, um, yeah, not just a polarization switch also, but really is an ultra fast um, switching of the wavefront. And um, we also recorded the full dynamics of this. Yeah. So it's um, what I'm showing you here is now a cross section of our camera image for the case of um, Gaussian to vortex beam switching. So basically, a, a vortex beam is characterized by these two maxima here in this case, the Gaussian beam by a single maximum. Yeah. And then we see that at zero delay, um, we have these two maxima. And yeah, about at the, at the yeah, for, for about a, a pulse length of our laser, this goes to a single maximum. We can also take a cross section here and get the foreign line showing these dynamics. Yeah, these are the guys who worked on this, Atyom and um, Tina and Filippo from um, Politecnico di Milano. All right. Um, yeah, so basically we were able to show the 12 second scale diffractive switching in this hybrid meta-optical system um, for these three examples of Gaussian to vortex beam um, switching, diffractive, diffraction switching, and topological charge switching. Um, but in principle, um, we are not limited to that. We could switch between any two arbitrary wavefronts and also do this with pulse duration limited dynamics. So if you had a faster laser, like a, a shorter a laser with shorter pulses, um, we could also do this even more quickly. Yeah. Um, so if you want, um, you can think of this as a, a very fast um, spatial light modulator. Um, I, I couldn't find any faster um, vortex switching in the literature so far. So we're quite excited and think this has some application potential, for instance, for free space optical communication, encoding digital information into the orbital angular momentum of light, um, yeah, which is um, quite interesting for free space optical communication because it's um, very robust, again, any kind of disturbance, and also it is um, yeah, um, quite safe um, regarding eavesdropping. Um, yeah, and with these switching times that we could realize here, we really come into the domain that is relevant for modern telecom applications. All right, I should um, conclude soon. <laughs> so um, just a very, this is a bit generic, um, the road ahead of what we are planning to do. Yeah. So we will continue um, to try to have, uh, obtain a better understanding um, of the fundamental properties and coupling phenomena in such um, coupled nanophotonic systems incorporating 2D TMDCs. Um, we will also push further towards applications here. And finally, um, the 2D TMDCs by themselves are still a very active topic of research. So every once in a while, new interesting the effects are discovered. And what we want to do is we, we want to stay tuned there and really also try to exploit these new effects for nanophotonics. Okay, so... Um, Come to the end, I want to thank my current team and um, also funding agencies. And I want to thank most importantly you for your attention and I would look forward to any questions you may have. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Mr. Dunn, for a wonderful presentation. The paper is open for questions. Yes. Thank you, Shabir. Um, my question is about valorization. Uh, I saw that it was an experiment with tungsten by Sedan, who was a level by layer, who is an interaction for the production. Second part of my question is uh, Do you think there is any evidence from solid state physics about this dual uh, dipole uh, mechanism of the selection groups? Well, thanks a lot. It's an excellent question. <laughs> um, okay, so okay, I skipped some of the technical details in the interest of time, yeah, <laughs> maybe, or yeah, it was probably somewhere, but only very quickly. Um, so for the experiments with the gold nanoparticle, so um, where we try to yeah learn how to understand and model these systems better, we used a molybdenum disulfide at cryogenic temperature, so for Kelvin. Mm -hmm. And it was separated from the gold particle by a thin spacer layer so that we can sort of um, avoid most of the chemical effects and so on. Um, second question was so, can, can you repeat what was? Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, yeah. So the dual dipole, yeah. So we were very excited about that, yeah. And we actually collaborate with some groups who try to calculate this, yeah. Um, it's quite challenging, so we don't have any conclusive answer on this yet. But um, we did on our end sort of what we can do and try to really look at the emission. It's a bit ongoing work, so um, it's a bit speculative also, yeah. Um, so. Um, we look very carefully at the um, polarization properties of the light emission. And um, what you note, if you look at the literature, is um, that it's sometimes really a question of definition. What is light right-handed circular? What is left-handed circular? It always says like the, the, the PL follows the excitation helicity, which um, we think is not entirely true because if it has the helicity um, that's preserved there, it would be a truly chiral emitter. A rotating dipole is a truly chiral emitter. It has a mirror plane and it basically emits light of one handedness in one direction, light of the other handedness in the other direction. If you integrate or if you calculate the, like the chiral density of that, it goes to zero. Yeah. So it's not a truly chiral object. This dual dipole is. Yeah. Um, but um, it looks like, um, at least in our ongoing experiment, it looks like if you look at the, at the monolayer by itself, um, that this is actually described by a rotating dipole. So in principle, you have to say that the PL does not follow the helicity of the incident light, but probably the circular polarization of the incident light, I think would be more correct to my current insights, but we should discuss maybe more. Yeah, so um, it, it's really, so, so we have no evidence of solid state physics for the magnetic field, so, but it's also no result there yet. Yeah, this ongoing. Mm -hmm. Are there any other questions? Yes. For that great talk. Can you comment a bit about the scalability of the two data materials? Uh, for example, you show flakes, but there's work with the uh, NOCD reactors, things like that. Uh, and what kind of challenges you're going to find going from the, the smaller scale up to the larger scalability? Yeah, thanks for the question. Um... Probably I'm not the best person to talk there because I'm not a grower by myself. Yeah, I mean we are quite happy um, that through the collaboration with Andre the Channing Group in Vienna we have access to CBD grown flakes, so they just grow these fully monolayers in a very nice way. Yeah, um, so they're very high quality. They can get fairly large hundreds of microns. Yeah, um, and usually there are many of them, so. This enables us if we have several metal surfaces, tuning parameters, also typically we end up with monolayers of each of these metal surfaces and really can do systematic studies. I think that's an important point for us in research. Yeah, I'm not sure how much this can be pushed towards really wafer scale or so, but I mean, this one work I showed also by Jim Yon's group, they show these, um, I think, exfoliated flakes, which are really like millimeters large. So I guess there, yeah, there, there has been um, some progress also recently there. And, Really hard to tell for me how scalable this will be, but I think people are working on this. There is constant progress. It's getting better and better. If you look at all these works, I would be quite optimistic that this can eventually be scaled. Mm -hmm. One last question. Yes, please. Uh, 
think it was largely covered by the gentleman there about scalability. Uh, you show the interplay between a 2D material and a metasurface. So um, about the metasurface itself, other design constraints when you put it together with uh, to the material. For instance, we show the silicon metasurface. So you have constraints in regard to this is do you need have you tried other materials? Uh, have you tried different shapes? What would be the design rules when you want to combine the two together and if you want to scale them up? For instance, if you would need an adhesion layer in between uh, to, to make it extendable and grow, uh, do you think there's going to be secondary interactions in the intensive physics? Yeah, more than one question. I try my best. Yeah, so it's a very broad question. Yeah, so I think the design in the end depends on the effect you want to show, of course. Yeah, so from what I showed you, we had these many different uh, designs and also materials like silicon, so plasmonic, like this gold, and so on. Um, and typically, what we try to do is to put some kind of spatial layer so that the material itself um, is not really in contact with the, yeah, with the, with the plate. Like ideally, you would encapsulate it in, in HP and also for really isolate and find properties from whatever you have in your metal surface below. Yeah, um, yeah so I mean, for, for design, you have to think, what do you need? And then usually you use yeah, natural solvers to optimize and calculate for that, right? Um, I mean, at least it, it's hard still to, to model this direct coupling, but um, what's very well possible is to to model still the electronic properties of the of the metal surface by themselves, like instead of having a high Q factor, for instance, yeah, or certain directional properties. This is something you can model on the computer. Yeah? Um, for transferring the TMDs, I mean, um, it's yeah, so we put them on top, so they are partially freestanding. So since we usually do a wet transfer, I mean, this works quite well, yeah. Um, but I think for, for instance, if you want to do stamping, like dry transfer, and um, people have sometimes the problems on metal surfaces, if there's too little um, surface, you have some small pillars also, the, the flakes will not fit very well on this, on this for instance, yeah, but, um, yeah, I mean, this is not something general. It really depends on, on the system, on the structure. It's, it's still in the in the state where you have to find individual solutions really for your target system, I would say. Yeah, uh, not really something general there. Yeah.